And I, I should kick off with a little anecdote, which is um, at the height of COVID, uh, to avoid going crazy, I started a sake brand. I don't know if you know this. No. I started a sake brand, and the sake was terrible. Um, <laughs> and selling it online was hard. And I was Googling around, and I found this amazing tool, Photo Room, to help me make my terrible sake look beautiful uh, using your, your early AI. So I've been a, an advocate and a, and a user for a long time. Sadly, the sake didn't work out. <laughs> However, Photo Room has gone strength to strength. And perhaps we should start with just a little introduction to Photo Room and a little bit about your background and why you started the company. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, you know the details of the COVID part of your, yeah. your sake brand, so it's interesting. And we're getting better with bottles and reflections, so you'll okay. be happy with that. <laughs> But um, yeah, in a few words, uh, Photoroom is uh, an app, uh, mobile web API that enables any entrepreneur, any small business in the world to create studio quality photos, visual for their business, both for the catalog and uh, the marketing of their, of their, their business. Um, and really our mission is to enable these entrepreneurs to create Nike level, LVMH level visuals so they can well play on the same level, the, same field as, as the bigger brand, and we believe like the diversity of commerce is very interesting here. Um, and so my background is I've been working on the photo side for now uh, 15 years, uh, started on the, when I was at Stanford, and I've seen the photo industry evolve. I've been working on AI for the past 10 years, so really this year, as you say, has been like a for, formidable acceleration of the AI space. I've never seen that. And I was well, the reason I started Photoroom is I, I was at GoPro. I was head of like two uh, visual video apps, and I was I got very frustrated that it was very difficult to develop AI product, AI first product. I realized like you have to like kill everything and start from scratch, and that's why I, I left and uh, and started Photoroom. And I had my pain point as a product manager to create good visuals, and I realized talking to users that actually like it's half a billion people, hundreds of millions of people who are while well, doing side hustle, starting small business, and they're struggling because they don't know how to create good photos. But today, what we see online when we buy is a photo. So it's one of the most important things you can do to help entrepreneurs. And we decided to focus hard on that part to well, enable and empower these entrepreneurs to, to start their business. Um, one of the most amazing things about Photo Room, I think, is the capital efficiency. I think a lot of people will think AI and think, wow, that's a huge amount of money to be burned. Uh, but actually, as I, as I recall, if I'm right, you haven't touched the money we've given you yet. Um, so uh, we're very happy we did, though. Um, when you think about that, can you explain a little bit about, I guess, how you've managed to achieve that capital efficiency and also how you think about building your team in a world where, obviously, AI talent is exceptionally rare? Yeah. Um, so I think from the beginning, and so we started on mobile, and one thing that made us very efficient and lean is is the App Store engine. So we were able to distribute our app all over the world well, without like a big marketing team. So it makes like focusing on product, focusing on engineering, and really being like focusing on hiring the best people here and not uh, scaling, well, not scaling the marketing early on. So that, that helped us a lot in the early days and made us like grow very fast. I think we, I mean, we did Y Combinator. We're one of the fastest like growing company with some so little capital uh, going from one to 20 uh, million in an hour. And then it's, uh, so it went this way and we always kept like impact as like impact per employee. And that's something we actually sell to like the best people in the world. Like you're gonna have so many, so much impact to your user. And that goes a bit like impact is how much people, the value you create is how much you pay someone to, for the value they deliver. So that was one of the North Star. I know Stripe has been doing the same and it's kind of the YC. Uh, I mean, one of the great YC company. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the uh, that's first part. And then on the AI side, it's kind of we've been really trying to focus on, well, useful AI and always start from open source. So that's been like, a, we're not a research AI company. We're really like a useful AI company. We talk to our user and then kind of train the model, fine tune the model, change the model to, to make it efficient. So that's, that's been the other part on the AI side for efficiency. And maybe you could go into that a little bit more, because obviously another thing people think about AI companies is, well, you must rely on sort of open AI or, or Anthropic or one of these big closed model providers. Yeah. Obviously, most of what you do is diffusion models. Yeah. But do you want to talk a little bit about you know, how that model choice came about and how you're thinking about building defensibility into some of these features going forward? Right. So again, I think one reason Photoroom, uh, and you highlighted it that with the useful and application layer, what we do that's 
well, different is we're, we're not a research AI company. We are useful user-centric uh, AI company. So the best way to do that is to train your model based on your user feedback. And so not to make high commitment, high kind of high capital investment before doing that. What we do is we start from open source and Photomon wouldn't be here today if there wasn't some great open source model out there. And so we start with open source. That's, uh, that's what we did with the first app for background removal. We pull like an open source model and put it in the app. And then we learn what the user, uh, the, from the user feedback. They tell us this is working, this is too, too slow, this is like this part, we don't care actually about this part, so you don't need it, you can cut it. And that's, that's been very, very helpful to us. So on the diffusion side, for instance, well, we start with open source, so with diffusion model, and we learn what doesn't work. We learn that people, they want speed, especially on a mobile app. They, want, uh, they, they don't want hallucination. So we kind of fine tune and develop the model around that. And now we are training from the ground up, from scratch, the model, but with architecture trade-off that makes it the best for what we do. So we just focus on photography. We don't do illustration. It makes us like 5x faster. Mm. We make like some uh, hardware, uh, low-level choices on the architecture also makes us a lot faster. So we really come like from the user need and develop, design the architecture of the neural network from that part. And that's, that's what we do very differently from others, I think. Mm. And, and obviously, that's from the sort of bottom up, the AI model side. On the user experience side, you know, photography is, is one of the main use cases of the smartphones in the world. It's obviously a very competitive space. You have Adobe at the professional level. You have Instagram and Meta on the, on the social media level. How do you think about competition and navigating that huge, huge world of photography going forward? Right. So um, I think what's important, and that's kind of the big revolution of AI here, is that the incumbent, they are, like, they're building for the existing, their existing customers. And that's actually what the, the trouble I had at GoPro is developing a new software for new users, and we couldn't do it. So I think Adobe is developing, well, co-pilots, for instance, for existing designer using uh, Photoshop. And so they spend eight hours a day, and you can't like, remove buttons from them. Like, it's going to yeah. remove their, their rent, their jobs from them. And so what Photoshop does is, well, the next generation of people, the 10x more people that are going to use photography, how can we help them make that more accessible? Um, and we think it's more like an autopilot image. I think if you take the car analogy, like uh, Adobe is working on uh, how can I create this um, interface that helps the people drive. They already know how to drive. Like, uh, it's already drivers. But when you think of the Tesla approach in five years, 10 years, will people like, still learn how to drive? Do you really need that? And we're, we're kind of, OK, you don't know how to drive, so we're doing the autopilot. And you, you tell us, like, I want to go from point A to point B. I want like, uh, from Paris to Cannes. I want like, a scenic drive. And we help you on that. And so that's, that's our approach. And we think for design and photography, at least, for, with all these entrepreneurs, it concerns 10x more people than what Adobe is doing. So we're, I think, addressing a very different persona, a very different audience that uh, what Adobe is doing. And it actually, I think it's 10x bigger than what Adobe is doing today. We do too. Um, when you think about your, when you think about the sort of the strategic positioning of the company as well, just geographically, uh, you know, obviously you, you did Y Combinator, sort of, you know, very American focused culture. You're back in Paris a lot of the time now. Yeah. How are you thinking about building this company going forward? And uh, what's the talent like here or, 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 or across Europe uh, and their availability to support you to grow? Right. I think, well, one of the great points, I think London and Paris are similar here, is that you have great, a great pool of talent, a lot of math in the engineering space. And so you're, you're able to hire people. Like when I was before at GoPro, for instance, like if the company is not doing well, like all the Meta is going to hire them from one day to another. Now for AI talents, OpenAI is hiring anyone in, everyone in the, in the valley. So being in Paris is great for talent. We're actually pulling talents. Our head of AI came, comes from Meta. We made him move from California to Europe. And well, people are happy to move. Like Europe offers different values, but so, some people are happy to take that. And, and Paris is a great ecosystem for AI. Like uh, you, have, I mean, you mentioned Hugging Face, biggest office is there. Uh, Mistral is our neighbor, uh, Dust, Nabla. So it's, it's a great pool of talent, mm -hmm. rich escape velocity. So uh, it's great to hire from there. It's getting a bit competitive too, but uh, I think we have now the resources uh, to, to hire and have the best here. Yeah, for sure. Um, obviously, to, once again on Europe, uh, the EU AI Act is in its first stages of going, um, becoming legislation. There was obviously the Global AI Safety Summit in London last week. You will have seen the executive order as well coming out of the White House and AI regulation. 
Uh, all of these things are thinking about some frontier risks of AI, yeah. but you're generating photos. Yeah. Um, and that's a very real and present risk in some people's eyes. Um, how do you think about safety uh, when you're generating uh, images for people? Um, what do you think is going to have to happen over the next couple of years in your whole space of generating both images and, and maybe even video and, and voice like you saw in my avatar? Yeah. So I, I think like most people we are not aware of, but we're already using AI today. Like most of like your photo app, most of them use AI. So we're already like using AI at scale, and that's something you we want to keep that in our mind. Uh, then I think like it's a giant leap in what you can do, and it's making it more affordable. So deep fake, it might be like one one percent of what people have produced is going to be a, a risk for like the same way social network is. So that's like that's a concern. We're also working a lot on bias to make sure all data set we're training on are unbiased. It's very important. Um, and then I think the regulation needs to happen more on the use case and not like uh, depends what you're helping your user do more than like uh, like open source or foundation model. Like, uh, this the regulating all the open source at once or all the foundation model, I think has a big risk of uh, regulatory capture, and that's we we should be very careful about that. Um, again, the next well, the next few years will like change a lot. I don't know in three, five years if or if or if we still like believe any photo we'll see. Like I don't know if my kids are like uh, seven from one to seven. They'll they'll read some things. They'll see an image. They'll know it can be generated, and that's kind of a state of mind we need to change. Mm. I think what uh, we were yeah. I think one thing that's interesting is like maybe in the future what you need to prove on the watermark is like what is an image that was really taken from a photography more than the other part, like proof of being real than mm. proof of, uh, the proof of not being generated.